All right, here's the 66 Corvair. I've been driving it more often, but it left me stranded the other day. I got stuck uh, on the other side of the interstate, which is just right over here. You can hear the cars. Uh, but anyway, what happened was I was uh, just leaving to go to O'Reilly's to get some vacuum hose for the Pontiac. And uh, I got to the light and it just started stalling. And I was able to, uh, you know, I had to get it started. I had to hold the accelerator down. And I just barely got across. It was losing power, stalling, light was green. I got it through the underpass and over on the shoulder where cars are exiting the freeway which is kind of a pain in the butt because you could get hit. So I had to get out and push the car over. Anyway, it, it would just kind of miss, fire and miss, enough to keep the battery alive. It wasn't killing the battery. Just uh, So I got back here, and I thought it was running out of gas because the way these new fuel sending units, it stays on empty when it's almost a half a tank. But anyway, the accelerator pumps, the accelerator pump jet thing, it was shooting in there. There was plenty of fuel. It, was, it didn't smell that rich, but I had a hunch it could be flooded because I ran into this problem before. Well, anyway, it would only run with the throttle open fully. And first thing I thought after that, after checking the fuel, was there's got to be a vacuum leak. This crossover is actually known to leave people stranded because they didn't suspect a small vacuum leak in the little hoses. They dry out. Well, that's not my problem because I put these compression fittings here. Hi, okay, uh, I just wanted to cut in on the introduction uh, just to speed up a couple things. It's made for a really interesting video and the main point of it now is so other people will learn from uh, what I ran into, this kind of a, a wild goose chase. And you can see back here I got the 66 uh, four-door, my 500, and yes, now it's running better than ever. Uh, if you watch through about half the video, I come to the conclusion that I found the problem and that's not so. So anyway, the car dies at the intersection. I'm going under this I-29 overpass to go to Casey's and uh, it starts to run really rough and I'm like, uh-oh, and I had to put my foot into it just to keep it, to keep it going. I'm like, what's going on? I have no idea at that point. The car dies, I get it started, the light's red, I'm waiting on a green light and I finally get it through there and pulled over to the side. So I'm thinking either, it was just, it was weird. It was definitely a fuel type of issue. I thought uh, definitely a fuel type of issue. So I pull over, we get jumper cables, can't get it started. Uh, just as I said, ended up towing it back. So I'm thinking, the only thing I could ex uh, figure out is I had a spark issue or it's just flooding and the floats are stuck. I got these really nice uh, metal needle valves, if you can see them on the camera. But anyway, so I called the wife, she came over to help me and brought my tools. Stupid me not having my tools with me. Checked the uh, points, they turned out we had 12 volts, or you know, nine here. Uh, I still thought there was something maybe wrong with the coil. Had her turn it over, I could see sparks, but barely, barely see the sparks. Anyway, I tow it back here with the tow rope, screw up my bumper doing so, not too bad, you can see. This is a kind of a, a car I rescued, so I, I gotta fix that now. But anyway, um, so it'd be 300 bucks on a tow, just going you know down and around here. So anyway, long story short, I got on the uh, the Corvair group there and people were saying maybe the carbs are dirty and I thought, yeah, maybe there's something clogged, I don't know. Uh, I pulled the plugs and they were awfully carboned up. And that's another story that I'm aware of. There's a there's a uh, two of the pistons I've got the rings kind of worn worn out. It was my own fault from an earlier flood and I think I washed out the the rings, but I'm I'm working with that right now. Uh, I cleaned up these three were worse. This is the last one. These plugs uh, had so much carbon, I could chip it off. I could chip the carbon off of the, and it was clogged up inside here and everything. So I took a little hacksaw blade, cleaned all that up, you put it on my wire wheel. I'm, so I got those back in. I put the scope down there, and yeah, I'm not getting a good spark anyway because the electrode is not very efficient. 
So that's why I saw a small amount of spark. And I, I plugged one in and put it up here on the ground. And yeah, it was a very weak spark. So anyway, I pull the carbs off. They look really clean. Floats are working. And then guess what? I, pull, I take the carb apart and guess what the problem was? The vacuum pull off broke. So yeah, as soon as I get it back to the office, uh, I check for spark. And it was a very weak spark. And that right there should have narrowed things down a little bit but when the uh, cylinders are soaked with fuel uh, I dec and, and you got uh, spark plugs that are carboned up you're not going to see much spark anyway so knowing that I thought okay and as you see the choke pull-offs or one of the choke pull-offs was bad and that could have contributed to maybe about 20 percent of the problem definitely contributed to poor gas mileage but that wasn't the problem. Broke. You can actually hear it in there. The little diaphragm in there must have tore right uh, as I was taking off at the light. And got this, and it was the same symptom that I had heard before. And that's what I thought first, a vacuum leak. And sure enough, I tested this on my little uh, vacuum uh, tool there and it's no good. So I'm gonna put all this together I'll, I'll get it running and then we'll so yeah then I dwell on the base gaskets and again there could have been a vacuum leak there as well I'm glad I went through with this because I didn't have the upper and lower uh, insulating or sealing gaskets I just had that uh, hard plastic spacer in the middle you know for heat purposes but yeah you, you want to have both of those gas there seems to be a debate about it. I don't understand but you want that area sealed and uh, these days with all the, the time on these engines, you're not going to have a perfect uh, seal on that uh, without some type of paper gasket in between. Okay, I got the, back here at the 66 Corvair, I got the carburetor rebuilt here and fresh gaskets. I had a choke pull off as spares. It's always good to, you know, swap meets and stuff grab your good or bad uh, carbs so you get uh, a lot of uh, backup parts for you. But anyway, uh, I did find another problem, by the way, when I came back out here. Um, now before, uh, the stroke pullout went bad, so that was the actual problem. And I even disconnected my fuel pump and ran it lean and it still wouldn't run. Uh, but anyway, I found another problem when I pulled this off, it appeared on the hard plastic gasket down here. I'm lay this down. Oops. That there was actually fuel all over the base of this uh, heat spacer, this uh, temperature isolator here for the carburetor. And there's even a crack on it here. So that could have been a cause for a vacuum leak because I've been told by some guys in the forum to not put a gasket on the top of these. Well, I'm going to do it anyway because uh, that might have been a problem. I think that was kind of a dumb idea because you've got two flat surfaces. You don't know how well machined or warped any of these things are over time. So one really quick point that I want to make is make sure that you always have, these are fairly cheap. But it always helps to have a good stash of these base gaskets when you really need them. There's different styles out there. Um, I'm using these actually underneath that. This one right here. And on the head, it's exactly round, if you'll notice. But under the carburetor, I believe you do want to have these notches here. That matches up with that spacer. And if you don't have those notches, let me show you why you want that. Because it could interfere with your idle circuit. There's your idle mixture screw that acts kind of like a venturi of its own so if you match this up you'll you'll lose a good operation of that area here and uh, now this one i think it i think the reason there's two so it could work if it's upside down either way this little slot here doesn't matter it's out of the way that's already got vacuum uh, your manifold vacuum so you don't have to worry about that that's actually the one that I was losing to the choke pull-off oh and make sure that this uh, 
and 64 and up carburetors this little valve here that helps vent uh, the carburetor area it leads up to these bowl vents and stuff but that you want to make sure that that does close when you accelerate and it does open uh, properly so you want to make sure that this little uh, again 64 and up carburetors has a good vent seal right there so anyway we'll, we'll get this uh, all put back together I, I just I got everything back together I got the fuel lines on all the spark plugs in that I took out and uh, just doing a quick check I got the fuel lines up there's no fuel in the bowls of these so it already squirted a little bit of gas in there so I'm gonna turn on the ignition and let's see if it'll start up hang on one second so by this time I did change out the coil and that didn't make any difference at all uh, I actually had two coils I think I changed them both out changed it out twice um, but then I kind of gave up on things. Okay, ignition is on. And I got my little uh, starter trigger here behind the camera because the starter of this car is underneath the firewall back here. So you can't see the wire that's going in there. But let, let's see if we can get it started. Oops, interconnected that. Let's try it again, full throttle, get some air in there. Oops, it's kind of doing the same thing. We got the vacuum leak solved. We got spark, pretty sure, because you heard that. Now let's try a little bit more fuel on this side. Oh, there we go. Huh. So there's more to it than that. Does not make sense here. Oh, let's check and make sure we got fuel in the bowls. Oh, that one does. That one does have fuel in the bowls. Okay. So at that point, I thought, well, let's look at the points, you know. Uh, not the spark looked really weak. I mean just you could barely see it and that's with the spark plug grounded to the the bolt there, you know where you tie down your uh, uh, Spare tire and I'm like well, it could be the carbon I chipped off that carbon, but it was still weak So I looked at the points and yeah Definitely to me that was the problem They were about half gone and it was they were a good set of points, too But at that point I should have asked why are the points bad instead of just changing out the points the question needs to be why are the points bad there's a lot of things that you can do and things that can happen to the engine that will cause uh, the set of points to go bad well I found the problem hang on what did I do yeah right here I was uh, just like before I was seeing weak spark and I thought that was because it was flooded and uh, so I just thought you know what since that vacuum leak wasn't as significant or the problem I just switched out points I've never in my life experienced worn out points I've always changed something out before they went bad and I just got lucky I guess uh, but these are let me get it to the camera here I don't know if you could focus on there but they're worn so bad it was worn so bad that the edge of this and I had the uh, condenser uh, so I couldn't adjust it anymore so maybe they weren't even closing all the way I don't know it ran fine and, and something bumped it and it started you know that happened before too I had it rough running after I hit here's the lesson if you ever hit a uh, big bump and the thing just starts running bad that must have been it all along those points so I just turned the, I hit the starter with the ignition on and I got a huge spark that I have not seen in a long time. Now, uh, this came out of a Ford. So let me put this. Now let's plug it in and watch it run. And then I'm going to pull that vacuum line off anyway and see if it stalls. So it was a combination of things. Two things at once. Jeez. So glad to have this car running again because this is really the fun car. You could just jump in and go. 
Okay, oh, that doesn't belong here. Here, we'll just fix that right now. You want to make sure none of this stuff interferes with the linkage. All right, so I got everything connected. Let's turn the ignition on and turn it over. Okay, as promised, I'm gonna show you what it does sound like when we pull this pull off off. I haven't even done it myself. I'm doing this on video without me first checking because I thought that was the problem. But it turned out to be these points. I still got to set the dwell. I did it with the uh, business card thickness, you know. But I'll rebalance the carbs and all that. But just to show you, let's take a look at what happens. Okay, there's idle. Now we're going to pull off the uh, pull off vacuum, manifold vacuum. Okay, so anyway, uh, when I change that dwell, obviously the timing is way off, so we'll get fixing that. But uh, that's probably the issue with the idle. I shouldn't have messed with that screw. But anyway, I'm going to get my dwell meter out and reset the timing, and we'll see what happens here. All right. I thought the camera was on, but I just uh, set them again. Perfect. Perfect dwell. Yeah, uh, it fooled me. I thought it was a vacuum problem. It was a minor vacuum problem. I was losing some fuel economy all of a sudden. I noticed that, but the uh, vacuum advance, or I burned up those points. If anybody's got any advice on why that might have happened, I was running a Corvair coil, and I did, I do have a voltage drop, it's, uh, nine or ten volts at the coil. So as soon as I put the fresh points in, lucky I had a set. Um, I looked at the spark and it was bright as day. I was like, problem solved. Let's put it back together and go. Now, here's the thing. Uh, it still ran a little bit rough, but I got it all back together and I started driving it and boom, the same problem as I was getting on the interstate. It kind of seemed a little bit intermittent. It didn't make me stall. I got home and back, but it, uh, I was like, nope, that did not solve the problem. Okay, once I figured out what the actual problem was, I want you to see how the engine was running. So I put the bad part back on the car and here you go. You can see exactly what I was experiencing. And I'm sure you've had this problem. I've had it a number of times in the past, just didn't know what the cause really was. All right, I got it set up. Now let's see if it'll start and uh, hopefully it'll run the way uh, it was before. Here you go, here it is, right here, see? Let's see if we can get it started now. You saw that. Let's get a close-up shot here. It's running uh, rough and intermittent. All right, you 
see there how it's running it's choppy and rough and I smell it burning rich as well alright so I'm gonna cut it off I don't want any more engine knock or any damage Uh, there we go. Now I'm gonna put the timing back. All I did was bump the timing just a little bit. So it's back into that again. Let's try to start out one more time and then I'm gonna go back to the correction I made and we'll see if it does it anymore. It knocked a little bit when I started it too. Let me see if I can uh, rich in the idle and see if that comes out of it. Okay, so half a turn each carb. Let's see if it makes any difference. I'm happy that I well was able to well document this intermittent issue. Uh, it seems like every maybe three or four minutes it comes back and now I'm gonna make a change and we're gonna see if it does it again then I'm gonna tell you what the change was just to see if uh, if I'm right okay all right so I I did the adjustment that made the trick uh, the faulty component that is and uh, let's see how well it runs uh, the engine is, it's warm, but it's still, you know, it's been sitting for about 15 minutes, so. So there you go, it's running a lot smoother. Uh, it's still idling a little bit fast. I gotta check the timing, which I'll do that in a moment. And because I, uh, I threw the points in there, I looked at them earlier, the dwell is probably off a little bit. But that's how it should run. And it obviously was not running like that before. So, let me cut it off and I'm gonna tell you what the problem was. Okay, here's the culprit. It's in my pocket here. Oops, it was. Right here. Here is the nature of the problem, the cause of the problem, and the reason that I uh, I lost a set of points. <laughs> and there you go. It was the uh, condenser, the cheap little condenser. Uh, my main thought about that is before you would change points and condenser together throw them in the trash they were 89 cents a piece 50 cents a piece uh, sometimes maybe two dollars you know and then they went up to four and then they went to eight or whatever so uh, with the cost of these and the availability nowadays uh, we tend to uh, just change one out and that's what happened I thought it's not gonna be the condenser if it's running better I change the points there you go that's the problem but then as we see I tested the condenser and uh, it was bad okay real quick I wanted to uh, just test these uh, condensers real quick I think these are the these are two good used ones and these were the ones that came off of the car all right so typically you want to use an analog meter you can see the charge you know, the charge and the end of the flow of the current if you put it on the ohm meter scale, but a digital one isn't always ideal. Um, but we can at least measure capacitance, which that's what that is. So we put on the capacitance scale, put on the farads. There we go, farads. And uh, I was reading online these uh, condensers should be at least 230 um, 
or 0.230 nano uh, microfarads, which converts to 230 nanofarads, all the way up to 500 nanofarads. Anything lower than that, like uh, 199 and 200, then it's going to be bad because it's not going to be able to absorb the amount of uh, coil discharge spark which will prevent the arcing. All right. So let's take a look at these real quick. Let's do this real fast. So I put, I'm grounding the body and just uh, holding it right here with one hand. Whoops. It's not always easy to do without alligator clips. So let's see what we read. So there we got uh, 254 microfarads or 0.254 microfarads, which is 254 nanofarads. So that's one good one. The body. And there we go. If we could see that screen. That one is close to 300 or 275 nanofarads there. My, uh, or that's actually 0.277 microfarads, which is what we want. It's greater than 230. Okay, now... This is the one that was inside of the uh, distributor, and I noticed it's got a very smooth uh, body on it, and there was grease all over it, too. I don't know how. That, it was a little jelly type of grease. Maybe it leaked, because I noticed in here, this cover, it's not a very good capacitor, very cheap quality, because these all have a waterproof seal, and this one doesn't. So that was kind of a mistake right there. So cheap stuff isn't going to last anyway. So anyway, we connect that on there, and we get uh, 218. So it's below 230. Uh, but also, I noticed I was playing with this earlier, and it was kind of intermittent. I can't get it to do it now. Again, if I had an analog meter, we could look at the. It's not even worth it, because I swapped them out, and the engine ran better anyway. But yeah, it's just well, 0.229. But before it was 199, so this sucker is no good. And then here's the one that was on the coil itself, my radio suppression one, but it's tied to the same line, so it's going to affect things similarly. So we'll connect that. I'm trying not to touch it with my finger because your body has additional capacitance. There we go. 194.6, right there if you could see it. 194.6. So that one is no good. So yeah, on, in, in any of these diagnostics, if you're not a full, you know, a full-time mechanic with it, uh, it's just it's a long method of learning. So that's why I'm doing this uh, YouTube video. And one other thing, though, that I hope uh, you get out of this is uh, track what I'm doing now. Now that I've solved that problem, I'm on Fuely.com where you can track your fuel economy, and I'm doing subtle changes. Uh, subtle changes here on the Corvair and I'm seeing a difference on every fill-up so you can track that with me uh, I've done some timing changes just the way I drive of course the different fuels uh, I've got the uh, Nash fan I'm going to put on there uh, different types of viscosities of oil uh, so it's all going to be charted on there the next one I just did was an alignment and the alignment was way off so the best guy in town that said you can't tell me the numbers i know these cars been doing this for 40 years he screwed it up big time i should have known that when i took it home that night so i finally found a guy that let me sit stand there with him real nice about it we got the alignment perfect the car has never driven so well uh the problem was the rear the rear was set up wrong so yeah the rear was set up wrong which causes the front to be set up wrong and I had one of those uh, rubber bushings that was kind of cockeyed. We fixed that too, you know, in the front, in the front of the trailing arms. So we got that fixed. So now let's uh, keep an eye on. I'm gonna. I should be getting beyond 20 miles per gallon. And uh, the funny thing about this is the car uses a lot of oil. You, you know, the oil interferes with the combustion. So if I end up getting 23, 24 miles per gallon, even with that problem, that's going to be quite amazing. Uh, this car does have the larger intake valves for a one for the 110 heads. So uh, yeah, we'll we'll attack 
we'll tackle all these issues. I'll, I'm gonna put new rings in it because uh, I know there's two or three sets of rings that are bad. Um, okay, now we're gonna do the power foam just to clean out the carbon. I got about probably less than half a can. I'm not gonna put a lot in here. But when you do something like this power foam or anything else, plan on changing the oil before you really do some driving. So I'm gonna spray this in and then cut it off, spray a little bit more, let it sit for 15 minutes, and then get it out on the highway. Because we want all that uh, heat-soaked carbon and everything, we want it to get it uh, flaking and get it out of there. So let's start this up. And uh, watch the smoke coming out. And like I say, when I get towards the bottom of the can, I'm gonna cut off the engine and then let that foam expand and do its job. There we go. <clears throat> that last one, I was just trying to start the motor. I wasn't trying to start it. I was just getting the valves open and getting that foam down there. It expands is what it does. So you want it to come in contact with those valves and then we'll let it sit and I'm gonna put the uh, crossover back on and then take it out on the highway. All right, let's just burn out the rest of this carbon in here. Interstate's right here. Now that we got the new condenser, the point set, the carburetor all checked out, carburetor's uh, uh, balanced and synchronized, this thing ought to run really nice now. We got a slow poke in front of me here. I can turn around the camera now, let's see. RPM. 
I do need to adjust these brakes just a little bit, maybe flush them again. Everything's new on these brakes. Just, it did sit all winter. All right, let's get back on the interstate and go back to that engine. Okay, 20 miles per hour, 30. 40, 45, 50, <coughs> 55, 60, 65, 70, and 75. Brakes, make sure you don't knock the camera off. There we go. Oh, we got a car coming here. more points condenser fuel fuel pump fuel pressure float all those things that we looked at uh, I do have some low air in the tires I know that but everything else maybe power glide fluid low I don't know but yeah so now I can change the oil over and I'm gonna keep an eye on for oil consumption because that was a problem I was having before and then I'll have to do a compression test to see where we are, if I need a ring or two or whatever. Because I had some other problems before I want to address, but uh, yeah. Thing is working the way it's supposed to. And we're back at idle here. Nice solid. Solid idle. Oops. My water spilled all over the darn place. Let's take a look at the uh, the engine while it's running. How about that? So we're right at about 800 RPM here. Check the damper doors. Get the light open. That belt's a little loose. So yeah, I'm, uh, I'm pleased with the way everything went today. And uh, sometimes you just gotta spend some time and uh, on these things to get them set up right. So uh, thanks for watching this video and uh, we'll do some more interesting things like this in the future, hopefully they're more directed towards 
interesting things instead of fixing uh, actual problems that we run into and don't know what the heck we're doing. So anyway, if you got any questions or anything, put them below. Of course, if you like this video, subscribe and, and uh, we'll have more of this material coming. That's for sure. Um, but anyway, oh, one more thing. One more thing I do want to mention is this drive that you just saw where I, uh, I ran the power foam to get all the oil and carbon out of the combustion chamber. Uh, I just got this new camera with a mount and just stuck it up there with a magnet. Didn't even realize you're not seeing the street properly. So we'll address that better next time. So uh, if you like this video, please subscribe to it because I'd sure like to do more. And that encourages me to, uh, to go all out on the Corvair uh, subject matter. And again, I kind of feel like a dummy uh, coming to all these wild goose chase conclusions. But I thought, you know what, other people, I see them in the forum all the time, people asking questions, you know, how do I fix this? And one guy I'll tell them it's one thing when it should have been something else. So uh, this uh, this method here, I hope it, uh, hope it helps you and I hope you found it entertaining or enjoy it, uh, and you enjoyed it. So, all right, well thanks and uh, see you next time.